Good afternoon, and welcome to New York Charter Schools Association monthly statewide webinar. I'm Yomika Bennett, the Executive Director of the New York Charter Schools Association. I am joined today by Anna Hall, CEO, Northeast Charter Schools Network, David Frank, Chief of Staff, Office of Education Policy, SED, SUNY Carrello, Executive Director of the SUNY Charter Schools Institute, Aaron Cochran, Deputy Executive Director of Policy and Operations at New York City DOE, and Corey Callahan, General Counsel and VP of Legal Policy at New York City Charter School Center. I have a few updates and announcements from the association, then we'll turn over to our authorizers and DOE for their updates. Following the updates, we will have our usual Q&A. You can place your questions in the chat. And today we have a special presentation following the Q&A on the New York RISE program, a program that will be providing technical assistance, guidance, and professional development to charter schools across the state. We are fortunate to have Heather Wendley, who is leading this project with us today, to share updates about the program's launch. Now for the association updates. In case you missed it, last week the CDC approved vaccines for children ages 5 through 11. A link to the pediatric vaccination guidance from the New York State Department of Health is being dropped in the chat. Also last week, OSHA issued an Emergency Temporary Standard, or ETS. Uh, these federal regulations apply to employers with 100 employees or more, including public employers in New York State and other states with state plans. The ETS rules require workers to receive a vaccination or provide weekly negative test results. They also uh, would require uh, they they also would require employers to give paid time off to employees to get vaccinated and recover from side effects. As you know, New York State law already requires time off for COVID vaccinations and for recovery from side effects. State led re excuse me state regulations also require unvaccinated school personnel to be tested weekly. So we generally have these rules in place. However, federal rules do preempt state and local laws. In this case, the OSHA ETS regulations will require four hours of paid time off for employees, which is currently what we're required in New York State. The same is true for vaccination and test requirements. So all of that's the same. The, the vaccination requirements, the time off, hours, et cetera. What the ETS brings that's new is, in addition to other requirements, employers must develop and implement a vaccination policy. Employers have until December 5th to comply with all of the ETS requirements, including the reporting requirements. Uh, the the uh, testing requirements must be in place by January 4th. So organizations with 100 employees or more should work with their HR teams and legal counsel to begin developing vaccine and testing policies and practices over the next few weeks to be prepared for implementation of ETS. A link to OSHA's website, which includes much more information on the requirements, including a comprehensive F FAQ about the ETS and a sample employer vaccination policy template is being dropped in the chat. It's important to note that ETS is temporary. It's authorized for six, month through, six months through May 4th. OSHA is accepting public comments on ETS through December 6, 2021, after which it could become a permanent rule. As more information about ETS or the reporting, reporting requirements become available, we will, of course, update you. If you have any questions about the 5 to 11, uh, age 5 to 11 vaccines or ETS, please email me. If we don't have the answers, we will reach out to relevant agencies and experts to try to get the answers. And certainly, we know there are a lot of questions regarding vaccines, uh, particularly the five, now that the 5 through 11 uh, vaccines are rolled out and new policies will take effect. On Wednesday, November 17th, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., the association, in partnership with Achievement First, KIPP, the Coalition of Community Charter Schools, Democracy Prep, and our Common Schools, are going to host a forum that's designed to provide parents, families, parents and families, an uh, excuse me, provide an opportunity for parents and families to learn more about the vaccines, boosters for children, uh, etc. Confirmed panelists for the forum um, include. Uh, Physicians from across the state, New York City, Albany, Rochester. We have also the Associate Commissioner from the New York State Department of Health uh, on the vaccine webinar. So you'll see this information. You'll come out in an email. We'll have a flyer that's sent out from the association and their partners. Please look for that. Uh, the webinar will be available in both English and Spanish. 
a special thank you to all of you who have joined us for the 2021 New York Charter Schools Conference. Your attendance, both virtually and in person, made the event a huge success. And we especially, especially want to thank our presenters, many of whom were charter school leaders from across the state who led informative and inspiring sessions, recordings from our virtual conference day, as well as our keynote addresses from Thursday and Friday will be available for viewing for up to six months after uh, the close of the event uh, for those who are registered. So you can find that on uh, Whova. And we're also dropping a link to the chat so you can access the information through there. Please save the date for our next New York Charter Schools Conference, which will be taking place in Buffalo on October 19th, 2022, through the uh, 19th through the 21st of next year. Tomorrow, November 10th, at 6 p.m., the New York State Charter Parent Council is holding its next monthly meeting. The meeting will feature Executive Director Susie Carello from SUNY Charter Center, who, of course, is here with us today. Hi again, Susie. Uh, we're dropping a link uh, to the flyer in the chat. This is a great opportunity for family and parents to get involved and become more knowledgeable about charter issues. So check the link, or excuse me, check the chat for the link, and you can share, please, that flyer with your school communities. Encourage parents and gardens to attend. In addition to the flyer, there's a registration link will be dropped in the chat um, as well. The association is accepting applications for the Aspiring Educators and Leaders Scholarship. Now in its second year, the scholarship program will award up to five $1,000 scholarships to class of 2022 graduating seniors at NISCA member schools who have displayed academic and leadership opportunities while in high school and hope to pursue a career in education and social or social service. Again, we're dropping a, a flyer uh, in the chat. You can you share that, please, with college guidance counselors, teaching staff, families, anyone who's relevant uh, to get, uh, excuse me, to, to encourage scholars to apply. The link to the application webpage is also being dropped in the chat. Application materials will be accepted through April 1st, 2022, and the winners will be announced at our monthly statewide webinar on May 10th, 2022. For the updates, I'll now turn it over to the panel for any updates. Welcome, panel. We'll start with our authorizers, David, Susie, and Lo uh, oh, David, Susie, and Aaron, in that order, and then we'll turn to Corey and Aaron. Hi, everyone. It's great, great to see you. Uh, so I just have a few updates. Uh, one, ESSA fiscal transparency reporting begins, uh, actually begun on November 1st. Uh, we've had a great response so far. Uh, the final deadline is the 31st of December. Um, don't wait until New Year's Eve until, you know, submitting your ESSA fiscal transparency report. I know I can be, I know I, I can find better things to do on New Year's Eve. Um, so please um, take a look. We actually, uh, we have some uh, great guidance um, and I strongly recommend that people uh, or that your fiscal staff read through it. Um, we, uh, our team here at SED um, led by Janet Klein in partnership with the other state authorizers Put that together. So uh, take a look. Uh, they're also having, uh, they're holding office hours next Monday afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, and it is hosted by our good friends at the State Association. Um, and Janet Klein will be there uh, reporting, uh, sorry, Janet Klein will be there uh, with uh, uh, members of the SUNY team um, to talk about uh, financial reporting. So uh, I'm sure the State Association will provide more information about that. Um, I also uh, want to echo Yomika's um, welcome um, to Heather Wenling, who leads our, our New York RISE project. Uh, the New York State Education Department has three guiding principles. Uh, one is a foundation of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the second one is a P20 continuum. So how do we connect uh, the work happening in our elementary uh, I should say our early childhood programs, elementary, middle, and high schools with um, the world beyond, uh, whether that's college or career. And then a service-oriented approach to supporting the field uh, with technical assistance and guidance. And um, Project uh, New York Rise uh, really exemplifies that approach to service-oriented support. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Heather and the work that her and her team at WestEd will be doing. 
Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Susie. Thanks, David. Um, hi, everybody. It's great to see all of your names. I still miss seeing all of your faces. Um, it is, as uh, 27 of our schools can tell you this year, all renewal all the time. Um, many of the schools are getting draft renewal reports for factual corrections. Others are getting ready for the Mighty Mighty Institute team to come in and sit in their classrooms and make their teachers nervous. And I'm really sorry for all of that. I've been at schools for the last three weeks going in saying, I was a teacher, I'm really sorry for the process. Um, we, we want people to be calm and confident. And that is what we found at the schools that we visited so far. So um, thank you to every one of you that has welcomed us up to this point and will be welcoming us in the future um, to get these renewals done this year. It is super great to be back and see your kiddos and your families and your board members and all of the leaders um, and the teachers actually doing school. Um, so that's my first thank you. Um, my second kind of uh, flag for coming up probably by the next time we see you in a webinar um, is that we are working on the draft RFP for 2022, as mind blowing as that is to, to think about that it's gonna be 2022, as you know, all of the authorizers that are granting charters have to put out a draft um, RFP for comment. And so we're looking to get ours out in early December. Um, so we'll ping you about that. Please pay attention. We do take seriously the comments that we get and we welcome them. So um, we're going to layer on a little request for all of that. And as you know, it's almost November 15th. It's one of Barb and Connor and John's favorite days. Um, the schools have to submit a statement of income and expenses within 45 days at the end of quarter one, two, three, and four. And so the financial reports are, sorry, one, two, and three, the financial reports, as you know, are due November 15th. Um, and just kind of hearkening back to my uh, thanks for everybody helping us at Renewal. Mike Lizinski on the team is working super hard with all of us to make sure that we're capturing all the great stories of your return post pandemic. Um, so do reach out to us. Um, in addition to trying to prep you up on social media, we also capture those stories and share them with the trustees. Um, and I think Mike was gonna try to put his email in the chat, if not, there it is. If not, it's on our website. So please send Mike your good news stories and let us know if there are great events going on because we wanna make sure that we support you by sharing those out. And one final um, reminder uh, with regard to Epicenter and some of the other opportunities that we have to file share with all of you, um, just ask your tech teams or you to update your um, software, hardware, it's essential for security. We wanna make sure that we get you all of those reminders in Epicenter to keep everybody in the right side of compliance world. Ah, the joy of running a school. Um, thank you, everybody. Those, I think, are all of my updates. Good afternoon, everyone. Just very quickly from our authorizing side, um, we are also all renewals all the time, which is why Lori cannot be here today. Um, and yeah, we are reviewing uh, your revision requests and all of your submissions. Um, so if there are questions, we'll be following up. That's my authorizer update. Okay, great. Uh, now we'll, we will switch to Corey and Aaron to do the New York City DOE updates. You wanna just keep going, Aaron, and then I'll I'll follow. keep on a roll, I'll keep on a roll. All right, um, so the first one um, about vaccine pop-ups. Um, so I know that some of you may be um, at a site that has a vaccine pop-up either already this week or happening in the future. Um, and based on information we've been hearing from schools and families yesterday, the turnout for pop-ups pop has just been extraordinary and we were just not ready to meet that demand. So we're continuing to discuss internally. And in the meantime, school leaders of sites with pop-ups should have received additional information from the DOE's chief operating officer, including a survey that you can take to help us better assess demand for the pop-ups moving forward. If your building is being used for a pop-up site and you did not receive this email, we are sending out the contents of that email in the C-Weekly, again, for folks at sites with pop-ups. Um, 
Ooh. All right, uh, I see Stacy in the chat, great. All right, so quick update on PEBT. Um, so OTADA, the agency that is administering the PEBT benefits, has confirmed that they have all of the data that you've very diligently collected over the summer. Um, so we are following up with them to confirm their timeline for sending out payments. It is looking like it will be later this month, um, but we are we will message out a new timeline as soon as we get that. Um, Another uh, big one, the digital equity questionnaire. So if you haven't seen this in the C Weekly, the state is requesting a brief questionnaire for each student about their digital technology access. New York City charter schools have two options to submit this student level data to us. You can either direct families to a survey that we are hosting, complete with translations, we'll give you backpack letters, um, or you can collect the questionnaire completely on your own and then submit it through Eastern Suffolk BOCES the same way you would submit any other templates um, that they collect. Additionally, we are having a lot of upcoming trainings related to payment cycles and all that good stuff. So please uh, review the C Weekly closely this week if you have not been doing so already. Those are my updates. Thanks, Erin. Um, I just wanted to echo on the vaccine clinics. We've heard from a lot of you on those, um, particularly for charters in private space who were not given pop-up sites for this week. So I just want to be clear that everyone knows this and the administration knows it. And so we're hoping that that will be included later on. I did want to put out, um, we heard from the New York City Department of Health, um, putting in the chat now, where you can actually request a vaccine pop-up. It doesn't have to be for the elementary school age kids. You could do this if you're a high school, if you're a middle school, it doesn't matter, um, but this is where you should do it. And then when you make that request, you should make sure you do a Mojo ticket to charter school office so they know. We do know some schools have been getting pop-up clinics for this. So again, another way to try and access, we know folks want you know as much vaccine as possible at their schools. So you know use that as well. And that is all I have. Uh, back to you, Yumika. Great, thank you. I'm actually gonna turn it over to Anna for any questions that might be in the chat. Yeah, and um, Corey and Erin, I might bop it right back to you for some of Stacy's questions, follow-up questions about um, those vaccine opportunities. But before I do, I would just underscore um, the digital equity survey, which everyone, every school, not just New York City should have received. We didn't um, specifically plug it for non-New York City schools, but this is the sort of thing where, um, and maybe David, cover your ears. Um, no one from SED is gonna come for you um, if your school hasn't necessarily submitted a lot of responses or parents from your school haven't submitted a lot of responses, but it is the sort of thing where um, if charter families are not represented in the survey, they are not represented in the state's plans for efforts around digital equity. And this is the sort of information that SED uses to create policy agendas um, that inform what they're advocating for legislatively in the next legislative session. Um, and it is the sort of thing that, that does influence how resources are allocated around um, digital access and equity. And we know that, we know from the past couple of years how important that, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> You have a, a visitor. You have a guest. I do, and I got a, I got a post-it asking me, is I got a fifty-dollar check? Oh, Liam, Liam's about to have a birthday, so and he <laughs> just got the mail. So I can have the rest of his back. Okay, can you now. can we talk about that in just a minute? All right, okay, it's on the <laughs> Sorry about that. Everyone. <laughs> After all this time, these things still happen. Um, <laughs> apologies, I just, I only saw him in the, in the screen. <laughs> I didn't hear him come in. Here, I'm coming. So long story short, do the digital equity survey. I will say, um, as a parent, having received it and being asked to complete it three separate times for three kids whose digital equity access is identical, it's not great, um, but I think, um, ensuring that that um, charter families are as broadly represented by making sure that you have sent it out is um, is important. So <laughs> with that and with my own personal family um, uh, goings on, Erin, um, Corey, do you, can you speak to some of Stacy's New York City um, vaccine specific questions? Yes. I'm going to just... go off camera to like... <laughs> 
<laughs> Just to piggyback on what you were saying, I think that we have a lot of charter schools across the state that gave devices to every family. And so you may be thinking like my families are all set, but the, the survey, the questionnaire is actually covering all aspects of digital equity, including how you even get online. Is it Wi-Fi? Do you have to go to a community center? So some, some pieces of digital equity that maybe you don't have as dear a pulse on that we are looking for um, that information. So just wanting to round out the, the picture of what the questionnaire is. And it's nine questions. It's not a huge lengthy thing. Um, all right, so going to Stacy's questions. Um, Aaron, it's the it's the question of do you um, can they get the, it, can they come back to do the second shot for the students? So currently that is not the plan. But as I mentioned, we are you know just given the um, extraordinary demand, we are internally discussing what these pop ups look like moving forward. And I'll just add the other question, which I know Aaron put in the chat, but just in case folks are not reading along. Um, some schools are still not receiving uh, either notification that they are part of a pop up site or are getting information from their co located school that it's not for charters it's just for district schools, what should those schools do Aaron. All right, so if you um, and if you believe you are at a site that has a pop up and the, the um, sites are listed online, so I will po post that in the chat. Um, reach out to us so we can get you the additional information. That being said, if there is a pop-up site at your school, it is for everyone in that, in that building community, not just for the co-located school. Um, so we are not sure what that inf where there might be misinformation coming, maybe folks are confused, but yes, if there is a pop-up site at your building, it is for your kiddos and their family members, siblings, whatever. And we have heard, and I'm sure Aaron's heard it too, we know there have been some, you know, sites are definitely having too many students, district and charter sign up for vaccines and then not having enough supply when the providers show up. But, you know, there is no, you know, unfortunately that's just a, not everyone is getting their shot, but it is not a, any one school is being preferenced over another. It's just, there wasn't enough supply, which I know Aaron said that you should have received a survey which hopefully will, if you give that information, will help uh, make this go smoother as this keeps going. Um, someone is asking about the temporary pop-up site. So there's still not a place to request the 5 to 11 vaccine. This was a link we were given on Friday. It is still good, they told us. So please just request away, put it in the comments. Um, you should still use this. This is, this is the site that the New York City Department of Health is using um, to request it. Erin, I just going away from vaccine, I did see a question on if we choose to participate in the New York City data collection of equity survey, do they do you report the data to the state? Yes. So we are we are running a New York City charter specific questionnaire. So you would not be participating in the larger DOE collection. Um, it would just be a charter school family facing questionnaire and we would package that to send it to the state. Similarly, if you submit that data to Eastern Suffolk BOCES, it will just all get sliced together and sent up to the state. Great. And then I would say the last question I think for New York City I see is, um, Aaron, when do you expect to have an update about the PEBT payments? Um, school, obviously families are asking schools a lot of questions. Yep, so we are waiting for that update from the agency that administers it. Um, I just spoke with them yesterday. Um, so hopefully we'll get an update from them this week. It is a large amount of data that they are continuing to process, um, but we have confirmed that they have it. Um, and so hopefully all systems are go from here. I'll just add on that front, um, one of the things that we've also heard and experienced is that the families who received these benefits in the past and still have the card are getting a letter in the mail that is um, very easy to mistake for a not important letter. Um, and so I know this is by no means sort of a clean universal solution, but it does seem to be the case that funds are loaded in the card if the families still have the card before they're either getting the letter or aware that they got the letter because the letter does um it, it is not evident that it's something that you should necessarily pay attention to so if you are getting those questions from families um 
you know, it's relatively easy to go to any store that accepts EBT and check the balance. You can even do it automatically at um, one of the self checkouts at Target, you know, any sort of grocery store. So I know that's not the world's most elegant solution, um, but if you continue to get questions from families in particular, if you think that it's highly likely um, that the funds might have already been added, um, even a family that you're sort of in close communication with, doing that as a test might be um, helpful sort of bellwether. I think that's really helpful, Anna. I know that there are some charter, New York City charter school families in the city that have received their benefits because there's some strange corner case happening. They were at a district school for a portion of the year or something like that. So there could be benefits already on a card. Um, I just know for most of the New York City charter school families, the benefits have not yet left the agency. Um, so David, um, at the risk of putting you on the spot to follow up on the digital equity survey, if a school doesn't believe that they've received the link for that survey to share with their families, um, should they let you know? Is there someone else um, who's a better point of contact? Or if you want to follow up and let us know, we can um, update people offline. They can just um, email charter schools at nyseed.gov. That's charter schools with an S at the end at nyseed.gov and, um, and they can connect you with the proper uh, office here at SED that handles that. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, Yomika, two questions coming for you. Um, uh, one that you might have just seen about inviting Mayor-elect Adams to address, address charter school leaders from New York City. Um, and then the other, going back to your OSHA update, um, about time off for vaccines. My, and specifically the question was whether or not that time off requirement applied to booster shots. My understanding is that because eligibility for booster shots right now is pretty limited and differs by state, that that is not part of the OSHA determination. Um, but what is your understanding and can you speak to um, uh, a future uh, cameo appearance by Mayor Adams, Mayor-elect? So on the um, the invitation, are we inviting Mayor-elect Adams? I was just about to drop in the chat at Stacy. Yes, yes, yes. We are definitely inviting. He's going to have a standing open, standing invitation. I don't care who's talking. Any point, any time. No, uh, we will. De we are definitely inviting him to um, to to talk to charters. Um, and on the question about the booster shots, uh, there the. Yes, you. The time off is required to be provided, but because the state, remember, has a uh, paid time off requirement for recovery for the shots. So, and the state, um, uh, it, it, to the extent that OSHA is silent on that, right? The state, the state can require that, and in that case, um, uh, for the boosters, the state has been clear. Yes, um, the recovery time is required to be paid. That's super helpful. Apologies for my jumping the gun, um, jumping the gun on that. Um, David, coming back to you for, um, or it might be just New York City specific because the question is about some information that a school has already collected um, around the digital equity survey, but some open questions that they do not have the data on. So I'm guessing that that is um, specific to sort of this opportunity to submit that, Erin, through the method that you were describing. Um, is the 1117 deadline hard and fast? Is it helpful for the school to submit what they have at that point? If it's not complete, what would you advise? So um, the survey data is at the student level and each student's response cannot be incomplete. So if you have two of the questions out of the nine, that is not a response. We have to have all nine. Um, the 1117 is a, and we've, I, we're messaging in the C Weekly a slight delay in the timeline. Um, because things are taking slightly longer than expected to get off the ground. Um, but the, the name of the game with the survey is to collect the data early, but to keep collecting it. So the goal is really to have as much data in as early as possible to inform all of this decision making at the state. But we will continue to collect on a rolling basis, um, at least into the early spring. I forget um, how long this goes. So it's, it's not one and done. It's just as early as possible. Let's get all those questionnaires in. Awesome. Thanks so much. And um, sorry, I missed that you answered in the chat, but I appreciate the, the narrative for, for um, folks who might not be um, also in front of um, 
uh, in front of a Zoom rink, a Zoom, blah, blah, Zoom screen. Um, so Gari, we'll, um, we'll drop that link um, that you're requesting for paid recovery time state requirement in the chat. Um, but I think now's a great time, um, Yomika, to hand it over to our special guest, Heather. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I want to introduce Heather Wendling as a member of West Ed School Choice Team and currently leads a three-year project to establish and operate New York State's first technical assistance resource center, New York RISE, and provide professional de development to all charter schools. Heather previously served as the Director of Learning at the National Association of Charter School Authorizers and as a Senior School Evaluator and the Director for, the, for New Charters at the SUNY Charter Schools Institute. Through these roles, Heather accumulated vast knowledge of both New York and national charter landscapes, led a variety of resource development issues, sorry, excuse me, uh, led a uh, variety of resource development initiatives and developed customized learning solutions that reflected best and evolving practices in the sector to address specific stakeholder challenges. Early in her career, Heather worked in charter and traditional public schools as a Teach for America Corps member. Uh, in Philadelphia, New York, and as a special educator, oh, sorry, in New York as a special educator, uh, special, special education teacher, coordinator, and instructional coach in both elementary and middle school settings. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. Michael, can we share the slides, please? Thank you so much. So it's great to be here. I see so many familiar faces and names, including at least one of my former bosses. Hi, Susie. Um, so, and I think there's also a couple of folks that attended this uh, overview also at Nexus Conference a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this brief overview, I'm going to take fewer than 20 minutes. I uh, just want to sort of introduce this concept, build a little brand re recognition so that you're more likely to answer emails and, and surveys and, and our outreach going forward so you know what to expect. And then also, so I can say this again and again and again, that this entire project, the success of this and our real overarching goal of this is to, for all of our services and PD and TA to be really needs driven based on the, the regional differences in the New York charter sector. So you will get a lot of communication uh, from my team and myself, really hoping to be, you know, to, to encourage folks to be candid in terms of what you need and, and how you need it. So we can, you know, really sort of fit those niches. So in the next few minutes, we're gonna talk about the vision and the goals for this project. Uh, David, if you cannot help yourself from, from pitching in on this conversation, I will not be upset. We're also gonna Sounds talk good. about, <laughs> I, I thought so. Uh, we're gonna talk about the PD and TA, you know, in terms of what we're going to provide and probably more importantly to some folks on this call, who is going to design and deliver those services? Because you know that's really that's obviously really important. You need to know what expertise you know is being offered to you. And then, lastly, as I've already you know sort of alluded to, and something that's really personally important to me, as someone that's been working in adult learning for the last couple of years, how are we going to engage and determine stakeholder needs to make sure that all of these things are not just teaching to the center and throwing sort of you know, redundant and irrelevant content into the void. We just wanna make sure that we are, you know, getting to know folks' struggles and challenges, but also highlighting really, you know, areas of strength and, you know, particular uh, success to make sure that that information is also shared so folks can learn from that as well. Next slide, please. So the New York RISE project overview, and by the way, RISE is an acronym that stands for Resources, Information, Support, and Engagement, uh, which of course, they're all of the things that we, we intend and hope to provide, um, is we are funded through a CSP subgrant uh, through the, the NYSED office. And this is a three-year series or span of professional development and technical assistance uh, workshops, webinars, et cetera. There's gonna be a lot of resource sharing. There's gonna be some peer-to-peer -peer cohorts that we're gonna be establishing sort of in the digital world. And all of those, all of that content is going to be designed in these four main areas. Uh, and David, if you would like to say, you know, a few words about why these were selected, but from my point of view and from the West Ed team's point of view, all four of these things are critically important to the functioning of charter schools but we do not see them as siloed. We see these as very fluidly interdependent 
because without any of these, without any of these four things, you know, being really present and an emphasis in schools, there will be weaknesses, there will be, there will be serious impacts to the student and family experience. So David, do you want to say anything else about any of these things in particular? What happens if I just said no? <laughs> That's, then we all keep no, on moving. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, so there, we, we came up with these four areas just from conversations with, with you, with schools across the state. Um, we spoke with other program offices here at State Ed uh, to our, our other authorizers. Um, and the questions that kept coming up again and again, or the, the uh, pain points where as an authorizer, we were, uh, uh, we were spending a lot of our time working with schools were in these four areas. Um, it, I think in particular, in particular uh, if I had to, you know, if I had to pick one issue that I think would, um, was at the root of many of the, the sort of the problems of practice that we saw in the charter space, it would be board governance and um, the dichotomy between governance and management. Uh, we also, over $3 billion of taxpayer uh, funds go to charter schools every year. And um, as good as we are, we, you know, we, what keeps me up at night are, are the finances and making sure that schools have strong fiscal um, oversight, but also um, a strong foundation to ensure that you're able to get resources out to kids. Um, and I think what really sets the New York charter space apart are our, uh, uh, that we, we don't have the fiscal issues that we see in some other states. Um, and, um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were providing support in that area. Um, regarding students with disabilities, I, just, I think the, the pandemic um, and the issues that schools across the state have experienced um, due to interrupted education and supports for students with disabilities speaks for itself. Um, and then I think lastly, the connection with community is uh, at the forefront of all of our minds, um, particularly at the state ed department, but um, we're, we're very interested in ensuring that all of our charter schools um, are community focused, if not community based. Um, and so uh, helping to uh, connect schools in a more meaningful way with communities, um, but also using uh, that connection to um, bring parents along uh, for the benefit for the academic benefits that uh, schools provide to children. Um, we think is very important. So those are that's the genesis of those four areas. Certainly, these are not the only four areas that schools are working on. Um, the the grant through the CSP program is not meant to be ex, uh, exhaustive, um, but we thought, saw that these are four sort of sticky wickets and we wanted to make sure that, uh, that charter schools were exemplary in these four areas, in addition to all the other work that you're doing. Great, thank you, that was, that was helpful context. One other thing that's worth mentioning as well, so we have these PD content focus areas. There's also a focus on, on uh, diverse geographies across the state. So one particular um, you know, piece that was specified within NICE's RFP for this work was to sort of privilege in some ways or just pay very close attention to the particular needs of schools in Western and Central New York, which you know, over, over time, historically, those schools have perhaps not had um, you know, the, the depth of comprehensive support or access or certain, you know, certain things that other schools in, in more populated urban areas have. So that's something that we are looking at carefully. And as I will continue to talk about, uh, the needs analysis process is also going to be looking at those sort of regional differences across the state to see what might be really pressing, you know, in, in Rochester or Buffalo, as opposed to Queens or, or the Bronx. All right, next slide, please. So I'm really excited to introduce essentially my, my team of subcontractors that's going to be working very closely with me to design and deliver the, the PD and the TA. So you might recognize um, some, of the, some of the logos and some of the names on the screen here. Some of them have gone under a little bit of a rebrand lately. Um, uh, so the Center for Learner Equity, until several months ago, that was the National Center for Special Education and Charter Schools. Um, the names Lauren Mirando Rim, Megan Olson, Paul O'Neill, those, you know, I think there's probably a lot of folks on this call through some, some lever or another have probably, you know, been, been um, had access to their work. 
They are absolutely the national experts uh, in, in a lot of equity driven work, not only around special education. So we're super excited um, to have Megan Olson and Megan Fitzgerald's expertise to, to really zero in on, on New York charter schools and build not only the really foundational sort of compliance side of special ed, but all the way elevated through really intentional, high quality integrated special education practice across schools. Uh, so could not be happier to have those two on the team. Tugboat education, I will say the name Paul O'Neill again, because as many of us know, he wears many, many hats. Um, in, in terms of the New York Rise uh, offerings, he is our governance expert. Um, so he's worked with tons of states and tons of you know, um, state education agencies and networks and schools. And you know, he's helped folks you know, really from the ground up open schools and revised bylaws and you know, all the way up to strategic planning. So he's going to be working with us, um, you know, as for you all with your with your boards and how they intersect with leadership and parents and all of those things. Uh, so lastly, we have Manhattan Strategy Group. They are perhaps at the moment best known for running the federal grant that um, leads the National Charter School Resource Center. They have they're similar to a WestEd in that they have tons of expertise across their organization. We are leaning on them for our fiscal operations and our parental engagement slash home to school connections work. Um, so you will be hearing from and learning from and seeing um, two, two professionals from that organization named Sally Wade and Carol Cohen that have been doing this work collectively for longer than many of us have been alive. So you'll and be I hearing- would just, I would yeah. just add, I know many of you probably haven't worked with Manhattan Strategies Group, but mm -hmm. um, as the state ed department and, and my office in particular, we get a tremendous amount of technical assistance from them. Um, uh, primarily on charter school program matters, but um, people like Carol have, have really helped us with other things, um, uh, our budget for many of our initiatives that we've put out, um, some of the grants like our teaching and remote um, learning uh, environment grant, TRLE, that you might have rem that you might remember me talking about. Um, so I'm excited about that one, among the other uh, partners that, uh, that WestEd's working with. And the way that we selected each of these groups and we were sort of you know, designing and launching um, this proposal to NYSED, we, we were very specific and intentional about looking for folks that had national expertise, but also local connections. So as you know, the CLE and Paul O'Neill in particular, and are also uh, the individuals from the Manhattan Strategy Group, all of them have either professional and personal connections to New York State, um, which as someone that is born and raised New Yorker, and I've been a teacher and an authorizer and a consultant in this state. I know everybody thinks they're unique, but I will be the first one to say that New York truly is. You know, so that was a, that was a critical factor in choosing these particular folks to be there, to be our content area experts. All right, next slide, please. So the nitty gritty um, about what we're going to provide and when and where. Obviously, the idea or the, the issue of in-person versus virtual is something that we're going to continue to revisit, probably on sort of a biannual basis. We'd want to make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible while still, you know, obviously respecting folks, uh, you know, perhaps reluctance or hesitancy around, you know, around large gatherings um, and also just seeing what's happening in terms of, you know, with, with caseloads in certain regions. So for the first six months, at least of this project, we are planning everything to be virtual, which really has a blessing. It's, it has a blessing and a curse, right? We can be extremely inclusive in that way. You know, not asking schools from Suffolk County to travel to Buffalo for a, for a workshop. Um, but that also provides us with some creativity here or we might say a full day workshop or you know, a two hour webinar, we can be really purposeful about carving up those chunks of time to be sort of segmented to different audiences. You know, so a couple of hours for a workshop might be really key towards special education coordinators or staff, or some might be for principals or, or general ed teachers. So we are going to continue to monitor the situation and also survey our audiences to gauge their comfortability or preference around in-person or virtual. But here, what you see on the screen is really the bare minimum of what we're going to be offering in each program year. Um, and you will also, e even in addition to the sessions themselves, we're gonna be developing content and publishing that through NYSED's newsletter. Uh, 
the, you know, the Nixa has already, you know, stood up as being a really great partner for us going forward. So we uh, are anticipating that they will also share out information about upcoming sessions and also tools or resources that we that we are going to be disseminating. And we're going to be collaborating with everyone that wants to collaborate with us, you know, over over the next three years. All right, next slide. Okay, so how are we going to ensure that everything is needs based? Uh, so in my in my last role for the last five or so years, used this Addy model for instructional design super heavily. Uh, I found it really effective and clear and really on point for, for adult learners in particular. And you see this, the top uh, piece of that pie in the lovely lime green is all about analysis. And that's really the discovery phase, you know, the needs analysis, the collecting lots of data, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, to try to really get at what, what topics and what sequence and what depth and which experts you know, are, are best fit for those things in order to make sure that we're not just pulling trainings off the shelf that people have already had you know, 10 times before, or that's not really getting to the root of their issue. So this is what uh, myself and my team are really um, fully committing ourselves to through the end of this calendar year. Uh, and then we will be putting all of that together and developing a calendar of offerings to kick off in January. Next slide shows a little bit more about, about who we're gonna be engaging. So some of the people on this call have already sat down with me, had meetings with me, shared resources with me. Clearly the authorizing leaders in New York, you know, uh, have, a, have an unparalleled sense of school performance in each of these areas as well as others. Um, so getting their read on school performance and you know, trends in areas of deficiency and strength is really key. Uh, and I say that not only because I was previously an authorizer, I also have deep respect for that work, but then also want to talk to, to school leaders, network leaders, board chairs, every, every, you know, every, um, every slice of this really needs to get to all of these different roles to understand those specific needs. Also engaging with support organizations. Um, so not only next uh, other folks uh, in New York City and also Western New York, so that they can provide input, provide feedback hopefully cross market and we can find ways that we can supplement each other's offerings. So if you haven't been hit up yet, we are we will probably get to you. Next slide, please. So here are some of the strategies that we are using. So individual interviews, um, obviously these are really labor intensive and I have a lot of respect and sensitivity to asking for too much of people's time. So the next best thing really is focus groups. We're looking to do groups, maybe of principals or network leaders or uh, you know CFOs or you know putting putting some focus groups together, perhaps regionally, because that will also you know try to try to grow the peer the peer networking aspect of this work as well. Going to be offering some office hours for folks that want to just sort of candidly or privately share, you know, maybe issues that they're facing or you know we areas of weakness or something that they've really been challenged with and maybe wanting to do that on a more of a personal basis. That's totally fine. Surveys, survey, surveys. We know this is everyone's favorite thing. During the, during the pandemic, I think folks, uh, survey sort of became a dirty word because it became the easiest way to digitally collect a lot of information. But it's, a, it's, it's one of those necessary evils to be really inclusive and maximize you know, the, the way to get um, the, the highest number of folks to be able to provide feedback. Lastly is document review, and this is actually um, sort of put me back into my authorizer days. I've been looking a lot at authorizer evaluation reports to, to get sort of baseline information um, and looking across, you know, these three content areas around finance, special education, and board governance, and I've already, you know, gotten a lot of, uh, of, of great ideas about topics that we can build out trainings around to, you know, to, to address some weaknesses that we're finding um, across across really in schools across the state very directly. Lastly, because I cannot, um, I can't forego the opportunity to do some needs analysis while I have a captive audience, we have just a couple of quick polling questions that we would love to have all of our participants answer. Perfect. So there's just three questions. The first one is single choice, just would love to to capture some information about the roles that are represented in this, you know, in this meeting. So we can, I can sort of, you know, to the as best possible sort of triangulate 
where, where the responses are coming from. So there's a question about role, please just choose one. And then there's a second and third question. If you just scroll down a little bit, one is presents you with a list, not a laundry list, the list of potential topics around special education and would love for you to, to choose what you think are the top three in terms of priority that would help your charter school in the next several months. And then there's a similar question around governance. If you could identify the top three of a list of, of potential topics that you think would best would best benefit your, your school. If you don't have you know, super close um, contact or if, you're, you know, if, if, if your work doesn't really touch either of those key areas, that's totally fine. You know, don't feel compelled to answer. Um, but if even if you tangentially or occasionally do and you have some ideas, would love to hear them. I'm going to leave that up for maybe another minute or so. Would love to get at least 50% participation if possible. All right, we're at 43%, 44%. So I'm just gonna wait 20 more seconds and I think we can get to 50, which I believe makes it statistically significant. All right, perfect. All right, Mike, can we end the poll and then share the results? To see if folks are interested. Excellent. Special education, there's a lot of interest pretty much across all of the potential topics with a couple of outliers for governance. That is really useful data. I will I will make sure that I review that with my team in a little bit more detail later on. Um, Mike, can you put up the final slide that just has my contact information on there? Um, really glad for the time. Really glad that folks you know took the poll and gave me a little bit more data to work with in the in the immediate term. Next steps: our outreach uh, continues, and. Uh, as I mentioned, we're doing a, a multi-pronged needs analysis process that's that's going to continue over the next, at least the next weeks, weeks or so. If I do not reach out to you and you have something that you are burning to share, either in terms of your, your school or someone you know has an exemplary practice in each of these four areas and they are willing to share something about it or we can highlight them, would love to hear from you. Likewise, if you have or you know of just a serious sort of area of need that you think training would really be the answer for, we'd love to hear that as well so that we can figure that heavily into our analysis when we're sort of design, you know, designing our scope and sequence for this, for these offerings. Okay, that's, that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And I, just, I just want to thank you, Heather, and just say, um, so this, this initiative is through our CSP grant uh, with the federal government. Uh, we were given money by the USDOE to do, among other things, help support new and expanding charter schools. I mean, one of the reasons we were given this money is to provide support and technical assistance to the field. Um, and so the more schools that participate, um, the more good we do through New York RISE, um, the better case we can make back to the USDOE to say, hey, this is something that charter schools in New York really need and want, um, give us more money. And that's, again, not money that just goes to New York Rise, but it's also money that goes mm -hmm. to um, new and expanding charter schools. So if um, any of your schools have ever received CSP funds, this is part of that initiative as well. So um, thanks, Heather, and we look forward to our continued partnership.
All right, Yamika, you want to close this Great. out? Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Heather, for your pres or excuse me, Wendy, for your presentation. We will post the slides shared today in the resource center, so everyone knows we will post those. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today at our monthly statewide charter school webinar. We will post a recording as well of this webinar in our new resource center under the webinars topic se section shortly. If you have suggestions for future focus, focus topics, would like to hear from other schools on how they are addressing certain issues, or have your school present during our monthly webinars, please let us know. These monthly webinars are made possible through the contribution and commitment of our member schools. We appreciate the ability to host these forums for the full New York Charter, New York State Charter School community. If you are not a member of the association, we encourage you to join today by emailing membership at nycharters.net. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone.